Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, a value investing service published by Stansberry Research. We have a very, very special show today. We have a really special interview segment this week. We'll talk with not one, not two, but three, count them three, of my Stansberry colleagues, all of whom have spent years trading stocks, options, and who knows what else. I'm really curious to get their three separate takes on the current overall market conditions and to find out, you know, just what they do and how they do it and if there are any pockets of opportunity that are especially attractive to them right now. Now, before we get to the interview, I have a couple things on my mind. First of all, thank you very much to everyone who wrote in with the book and other reading recommendations. I went to Amazon and bought two of them right away, Street Freak by Jared Dillian, and As You Wish by Carrie Elways, both recommended by listener Joe M. Thanks, Joe. Can't wait to get started on those two. Okay, so besides what to read, I, I'm also thinking about the overall stock market this week. End of the year, making new highs. It just seemed like, like something that was drawing my attention. And I've, I've done this often over the past couple of years, of course. And I'll just remind you, Mostly, I think it's a big mistake to spend a lot of time thinking about the overall market. I've learned from experience that it's a waste of time in most years. You know, whether it's up or down 5, 10, or 20% or totally flat, most years, you should just ignore it. Mostly, when the stock market falls, you should just buy it. That'll be the right thing to do most of the time. So it's not worth contemplating whether a particular, you know, 5% 5% drop or something is the beginning of a full-blown market route. Most of the time, all that is true. However, when it is the right time to think about it, and if you get it right, or anywhere close to right, I think you'll wind up doing 10 times better than folks who either ignore it altogether or get it wrong. So it's really worth thinking about when it's worth thinking about. Now, I contend that there are two times when it pays to think about the attractiveness of the overall stock market. One, when stocks are near historical valuation peaks. And two, when they're near historical valuation troughs, right? So when they're more expensive generally than they've been in their history, and when they're cheaper generally than they've been in their history, at the the real peaks and troughs, at the extremes. So before I say one more word, yes, I'm aware that valuation is a lousy timing mechanism. And we'll be talking with our interview guest today about what makes a good timing mechanism, but it's not valuation. So don't write in about that. I already know that, okay? (laughs) But now is one of those two times when I think you need to think about the overall stock market. We've been at or near historical valuation peaks for two years. So even though I continue to do bottom-up research and recommend individual equities for the Extreme Value newsletter, I also continue to counsel caution to investors doing the same. As I've said before, with the stock market making brand new all-time highs recently, my bearish this it looks like the wrong viewpoint today, and except for a few unpleasant episodes the last two years, it has been wrong. And I persist in finding these good bottom-up equity ideas. This year, Mike and I found Mike Barrett and I in Extreme Value added twelve of them that I think are pretty good ideas, and my other Stansberry colleagues have found some really good ones too. But I can't help noting what economist and asset manager John Hussman recently published. I don't follow all of his work, but his material on the valuation, the history of the valuation, I should say, of the overall stock market is unequaled. I believe it is the best work of its kind before the public today. And his work supports my thesis that you shouldn't worry about it most of the time, a mistake Hussman himself admits to making. 
It also supports the idea that right now stocks are more expensive than any time in history, including the 1929 peak. So only if you believe that it's different this time should you ignore the valuation of the stock market today. And, you know, and we all know what the answer to that is, right? It's never different this time. Hussman has chosen five metrics that correlate very well historically with the subsequent 10 and 12 year returns in US stocks. So when stocks have gotten where they are today in terms of valuation, historically speaking, the 10 and 12 year returns have been awful. They've been like flat to negative. It hasn't happened often. So, you know, you can complain about the lack of enough data points to be statistically significant. And I hear you, but you can't change history. And I understand that history doesn't repeat. It only rhymes and not, you know, it doesn't always rhyme in ways that you can figure out beforehand, right? But the bottom line is really simple, I think. If you believe that the price you pay relative to the value you receive is an extremely important part of the investing equation, you have to conclude that there's, that there's more risk in U.S. stocks today than, than most of the time, right? This is one of those two times. Most of the time, you don't worry about it. Right now, you do. So, you know, I, you've heard me say that a bunch of times, right? So I want to do something that I don't, you know, I always try to entertain sort of alternate viewpoints on things. And, and I do entertain ideas that might indicate I'm missing something very important in all my bearishness and worry about stocks making new highs and being more expensive than any time in history. For example, earlier this week, Joel Littman of Altimetry Research said equity market sentiment is in the doldrums like it was in 2001 and 2003. And he noted that margin debt has fallen from its highs, leading him to believe the bull market has more room to run before you need to start getting worried. Okay, so for and a, another example that might indicate I'm missing something, listener Dan M. responded to my request last week for book and other reading ideas with a link to an article from Institutional Investor Magazine called A Mysterious Force Took Over Investing, I Know What It Is, by former hedge fund analyst Christopher Schelling. And Schelling notes that the decline in performance of actively managed stock and bond funds over the last couple of decades or so, but especially since 2007, he, he, he noted that. And he also notes like Berkshire Hathaway's outperformance continued until 2008, and it's struggled since then, right, along with all the other active managers, right? And he says the cause of all this underperformance by the active managers is that 99% of all the data in existence has been created since 2007, and computers are much better at processing data than humans, if I, if I read him correctly. Part of the point of the article is that growth has beaten value off, and especially since 2007, but even longer than that, because of the proliferation of data and the ability of rapid advances in computer processing power to make sense of a world increasingly awash in more and more data. And Schelling says, quote, much has been written about how artificial intelligence and machine learning are expected to revolutionize investing. Frankly, a lot of this has been pure hype. But what has been lost in that noise is the undeniable fact that the massive muscular increase in raw computing power has automated and obviated most of the previously manual aggregation and annulus of financial data, end quote. He uses the word obviate. Obviate means to remove some difficulty, to make things easier. So looking at the output of a stock screen or on a computer is a lot easier and more efficient than what Warren Buffett used to do back in the day. Buffett said he used to find incredible bargains, like really good companies trading for two times earnings just by turning the pages of the Moody's Investor Guide. You know, one of those guides they used to publish in the old days where like there was one stock per page and it was loaded with data on one page. And, and you know, just had stock after stock. And Buffett, you know, used to thumb through these things and found bargains. And you can't do that anymore, really. I mean, you know, maybe every now and then, but in general, it's just not that easy anymore. Computers can do that work and buy the cheap 
stocks in the market like that in an instant. Schelling notes that computing power has doubled roughly every 18 months or so since the 1960s in accordance with Moore's law. And even though it's doubling at a slower rate today, it's still vastly outperforming the human brain, right? He notes the human brain hasn't changed in 200,000 years. Now, computers can't do a lot of stuff humans can do, but they can do things like play games. They can beat humans at any board game, for example, including complex games like chess and Go. Schelling concludes it's too easy for a computer to do things like basic value investing, finding the cheapest stocks by price to book, price to cash flow, or other simple value metrics is much easier than playing chess and Go. So there's not as much opportunity in those areas anymore, he says. I think all this is mostly true, except that one little thing, humans are the ones making all the decisions here. Humans are doing the buying and selling, not the computers, right? Humans are telling the computers what to do. There's humans behind all of this. At the very least, you must concede that computers are doing the buying and selling at the behest of their human masters, is what I'm saying. I'll, I'll never forget when Steve Sugar and I many years ago went to visit one of the turtle trader companies. I won't say which one it was. And we had a little tour of the place and we talked to one of the vice presidents and, and he told us, he said, if a trader does not trade a signal put out by the computer, it's a fireable offense, right? You can get fired for not doing what the computer tells you, in other words. Okay, that was interesting. And we walk around a little more and we walk into the trading floor and he says, here's our head trader. I'm going to leave you in his hands for a few minutes. <laughs> so the head trader says, yeah, you know, they were very, you know, we, we signed an NDA, right, non-disclosure. So they, they told us everything they wanted to know. And this is a long time ago, so I can tell you the story now without getting sued, right? And I'm not telling you what the firm was. So he shows us this trade the computer spit out like minutes before. And it was cable, which is otherwise known as the, the British pound, is referred to as cable. And, and it had gone down five days in a row, and the computer said to short it. And he showed us the chart, and, and, and it showed, showed the thing dropping five days in a row. And he looked at us, and he said, but do you really want to sell it after five days of this? Meaning, it's got to, come, it's got to snap back before it falls any further, right? So at that moment, I was like, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Not trading the signal is a fireable offense. And I didn't say that because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to cause a problem for the guy. But I walked away thinking there's a lot more going on here than mindlessly doing what the computer tells you. And I think that is still very much the case today. But of course, there are people who set up computers to do buying and selling the high frequency traders, right? They buy and sell in milliseconds. My bottom line on all this is that humans will always be human. They'll always pour money into ideas that have worked well for a long time. And that money will eventually always turn those ideas into bad ideas if they stick with them long enough. If they don't turn them into outright toxic waste. Look, if you can turn the U.S. 30-year mortgage into toxic waste by putting too much money into it, and if you can turn the sovereign debt of developed Western nations into toxic waste, like they've done today with, with trillions of dollars of negative yielding debt, then I promise you putting too much money into anything can turn anything into toxic waste. Humans will always be human. We'll never cure humans of their humanity. When they're in love with an investment idea, it still becomes a lousy idea, whether they bought it because a computer program told them to or not. And when humans ignore certain ideas because they performed poorly, or when the computers ignore certain ideas because they performed poorly, they'll become good ideas, no matter what any computer anywhere is programmed to do. So I think it's a big mistake to dismiss Schelling's insights out of hand, right? Because those computers are part of your competition in the market. But I also think it's a mistake to believe that the value effect, for example, is permanently gone from markets because computers can sweep the data for bargains faster than humans. As long as humans are humans, value investing will endure. 
Now, my discussion about Sherry Purchase in the last three episodes and my discussion today of why I'm still bearish underscore, I hope they do for you, I hope they underscore my overall view that investing in stocks is difficult and complex, requiring investors to entertain at times multiple competing viewpoints. Like Charlie Munger says, if you think it's easy, you're stupid. And we don't want to be stupid around here. And I think not being stupid is, is a much better thing to do than trying to be especially clever. But, you know, I don't want, on the other hand, I don't want investing in stocks to seem undoable. I don't think it's undoable. It's just complicated and difficult, like everything else in this life that is worth doing. All right. That's all I have to say about that. Let's talk with our three traders and see if they can help us get a handle on what's happening today. And I must warn you, these are three smart, experienced guys. I seriously doubt they'll see things exactly the same way. So hopefully you'll get some more competing viewpoints to, to deal with. And that is a good thing. Okay, it's time for our interview. This week, I have something very special for you. I thought it would be really cool to have a little kind of a trader's roundtable with not one, not two, but three of my Stansberry colleagues. And we have for you today, Mr. Ben Morris and Mr. Drew McConnell, who take care of a publication called Daily Wealth Trader for Stansberry Research. And we have Mr. Greg Diamond, who does the 10 Stock Trader publication for Stansberry Research. So I'm going to ask them some questions and talk about their various views on things at the moment. And I think we should start, if I could just, maybe we'll start in alphabetic order and we'll go like Ben, Drew, Greg. Um, if we could just start with you, Ben, and just what do you, if you, is it possible for you to sum up it, it, briefly what it is you're trying to do with each issue of the Daily Wealth Trader? Yeah, sure, Dan. Is that too uh, broad a question for you? No. I write it uh, every day, so it's not an issue at all. Um, what, yeah, what, what Drew and I do with Daily Wealth Trader, what our goal is, is um, first to educate people and keep new traders safe in the world of trading that is often... Um, often has a lot of people tout, touting huge gains and enorm, you know, taking enormous risks. So we try and put all that in context and show people um, really how to create low downside, high upside trades. That's number one. And then number two, we provide people with a lot of trade ideas um, so they can achieve their financial goals uh, safely. And you know, we're traders, but we're not looking to take big risks. Okay, that sums it up really well. Drew, anything to add to that? Uh, I would just add that um, we also do a lot of commentary on the market. So if there's something big that's going on, um, we usually cover it and provide our insights. And it's not always what you're going to see elsewhere in the media. We kind of look at things a little bit differently. So that's the uh, the one other aspect I would say we cover in Daily World Trader. Okay, great. Um, how about you, Greg? What do you try to do each time you put out an issue of the 10 Stock Trader? Uh, well, my my service is a little different in the fact that I have a, an app, 10 Stock Trader app that you guys can download, Who those who are listening. Um, and it's uh, I also do a weekly outlook as well. And basically what I'm trying to do is, you know, <laughs> about a year and a half ago, Porter kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, I want you to be uh, more of the on the, of the aggressive side meaning options. So I trade naked long options, which is tends to be very risky, but I stress, um, you know, as Ben said, you know, it can, it can be risky, but I stress risk management in terms of position sizing. But basically what I'm looking for are big moves in the market. I'm looking for volatility. Um, and that's where, you know, long option trading, um, can get you some big gains. 
And so I that that's the the trading strategy around it, uh, ten stock trader. And then you know with the app, I'm continuously throughout the day um, updating subscribers on various levels, various setups I'm looking at, um, things that are happening in the market, which I'm sure we'll get to. It there's no shortage of today. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of a constant, you know, um, almost like I was trading, I work for a hedge fund, I work for a pension fund, I work for a bank, um, trading various asset classes. And, you know, it's, you're constantly in, um, in a battle, you know, you're, you're in the weeds every day. And so I try to take as much of that environment and put it into, um, the service 10 stock trader here at Sandsbury. Okay. So definitely two different perspectives on trading. And before we go any further, I just want to say a word about my own view on technical analysis, because the three guys I'm talking to today, they actually do it and they actually know how to do it. And I don't know how to do it. And I think there's the belief among at least one of the group that I really think technical analysis is, is not a good thing. And that's not true at all. Sometimes I am critical of, of the way you know, like naive beginning investors do technical analysis. You know, that's when I start talking about, you know, it, it, it's random. They see these patterns like seeing, you know, faces in clouds or Jesus on toast or whatever. Um, and they think, I, I'm afraid that too many people think technical analysis is supposed to be easy. But nothing in life that's worth doing is easy. And these guys, you just heard Greg talk. You just heard Ben and Drew. I mean, this is not easy. They show up every day and they have a lot of experience under their belts and a lot of study. And um, so that that's just the difference. And in case anybody thinks I'm against technical analysis, that's not it at all. I just think most people, are, most people look at it the wrong way, but not the three guys in our program today. So, so with that said, guys, I want to get to the big enchilada first. And the big enchilada is your current view on where the stock market is headed, the overall equity market. And I just want to make sure I get it right here. Um, ben and Drew, you guys are basically in a pretty bullish stance right now. Yes. I think, from what I've read. Yeah. And Drew, you're looking for a, a pretty big downward move, correct? You mean uh, Greg? Greg. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Greg. That's Greg. Right. Uh, yeah. In the short term, um, I think we're going to see some volatility. But um, I, in the long term, I am uh, I am bullish. Just uh, you know, <laughs> maybe we'll get to it. But nothing else matters other than the Federal Reserve. I see. Okay, good to know. All right. So it's interesting to me then that I perceived it one way, and you and you're kind of correcting me a little bit there, Greg, because. You know, for example, you you did put out a thing recently that I I took it as kind of bearish when you were talking uh, about talking the cost about the semiconductors in Korea. Yeah. Sure. So so again, you know, you can you can have these, and I think this is this is you know kind of going back to what trading is. You know, there's no difference between trading and investing other than your time horizon. Trading is simply short term investing, um, and so you know you look for Dan, you know, extreme value. You look for longer, you know. 5, 10, 20 year trends. And we look for five day, five minute, five week uh, trends. So it just depends on on your time horizon to try to extract that alpha and using technical analysis, you know, you can kind of, um, you know, use different things to be able to uh, tell you, um, or at least give a probability because we all deal in probability, no matter, you know, what kind of methodology you use. So you use that probability to tell you, okay, you know, I think at this point, you know, there's a five day window where stocks are going to do X, Y, Z. And so, um, yes, over, you know, some of those things that I pointed out between the semiconductors and the Korean Kospi that told me that, you know, there is going to be some type of, of short term pullback. And we're, we're seeing that this week. So, it just it's a matter of time horizon for me i see and 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 ben i'll just go to you 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 are you guys are decidedly bullish yes um, and, uh, so yeah it's fun i'll i'll just say it's it's interesting that uh greg definitely operates on a much shorter time frame than we do um our trades generally last between one month and say six months. So we are bullish in 
the six month time horizon, even even probably shorter than that. But over the next month, um, definitely cautious. I mean, we've seen a big run higher, and while we're not going short here, we do think it's a great time to hold off on placing new trades. Um, so yeah, bullish longer term, cautious short term. And if I could just jump in there, Dan, you know, uh, it just Ben's comment just reminded me of something. So, you know, you talk about different horizons, you talk about, you know, he says one to six months and with myself trading long options, you know, you deal with something called theta, which is time decay. So not only, yes, I'm trying to create that volatility or not create that volatility, capture that volatility, but you're not just fighting against, you know, the direction of the market. You're also fighting against time. Now, when you get it right, you make a lot of money. Uh, when you get it wrong, you know, the good thing about naked long options is you know exactly what your um, loss is going to be, which is the initial investment. But, you know, again, it goes to the different different views that um, or the different methodologies that Ben and Drew use as opposed to what I use. So there's different, um, you know, I think if subscribers out there are going to um, try to get into technical analysis, I think the combination of, of both products are, are really a great way to start. Yeah. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. I mean, I... Uh... It, it it sounds very self serving of us to say that, but it really makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so time horizons are generally different between the two of you, and yet longer term, you, you both say you know you're you're probably on the bullish side, um, even if you're bearish in the shorter term. Yeah, and for me, uh, long term is maybe the next year. I'm not looking out much past that. I see. And Greg, for you, the same thing when you say longer term, a year? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, at least going into the next election, um, that that would be my, my time. So, yeah, a year. So, so yeah, about a year. How about you, Drew? Same thing? Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. So I'm I'm kind of leaning the same way that, uh, that Greg is. In the shorter term, we've turned a bit more cautious because markets have had a huge rally here and sentiment got extremely stretched. Um, and we like to look at a couple of different things. You know, there's book call ratios, there's distance from moving averages. You know, you can look at whatever you want. But over the past couple of weeks, uh, almost all of them have reached extremely bullish territory. So we've kind of pulled in the reins a bit. But longer term, the way that I see the market is that we had a huge run um, leading up into 2018. And then really, we've had a sideways consolidation. Yeah, it was very volatile. And we had a lot of up and downs, but now we are just breaking out of this again to the upside and that's bullish. So over the next year, two years, I want to focus on finding longs on weakness, not trying to short this market. I see. That makes a lot of sense. And if I could just start with you, Ben, um, I want to talk a little bit about technical analysis, because like I said before, I, I'm afraid that too many people think of it as it, it should be an easy way, you know, like a button you could push to make money come out of the machine or something. And, and I don't think that's what it is at all. Um, so maybe, I don't know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you learn to do this and, um, you know, what the, uh, you know, what, what is the core, what are the core ideas for understanding technical analysis? Yeah. So that's a big question. Um, I'd say I, I learned from doing and reading a lot of books and just seeing what works and looking at tons and tons of charts. Um, everybody has the things that they like to look at. For me, um, the trend is the most important thing. I use the 50 and 200 day moving averages as my primary trends, 50 being intermediate term, 200 days, long term. Um, to me, a bullish chart is trading above its rising moving averages and bearish is trading below its falling moving averages. Uh, that's one thing. And I also like to look at volume, um, the amount of shares that trades in a day. When there's a lot of shares traded in a day or a week, when the stock is moving higher, it means that the buyers are in control. The buyers are pushing the price higher and there are a lot of people interested. When there's a big volume spike, um, 
on a day or a week when the asset is moving lower, the bears are in control, the sellers. So that provides a kind of context. I don't usually trade just on that, but it provides some support for what I'm looking at. And then the other thing is that I look at certain levels, old highs, old lows, uh, and again, the moving averages as a way to define risk. Um, So if you're buying a stock and you can get in near the old lows, that may mean you can set a really tight uh, stop loss without taking too much downside risk. And that can be a good thing for increasing your position size potentially with still limiting your risk. So um, yeah, that's the main things I look at. So the trend is my friend. That's right. <laughs> that's right. How about you, Drew? What, uh, you know, how, how did you come to learn technical analysis and, and what's, you know, is there like a core principle at the heart of it for you? So I, I think I look at technical analysis a little bit differently um, than other people. And you may be surprised to hear that. I'm actually not a huge fan of a lot of technical indicators. Um, the basis for most of the things that I do in trading is really basic, basic technical analysis. I, I look at horizontal support and resistance. So <laughs> that's a real simple thing. Just look at, you know, recent highs and lows, like Ben said. Um, and then I like to try and look at where traders are trapped. So are there places that people maybe sold short that was uh, at a bad level and then they're going to have to cover to get out of their positions or vice versa? Are there places where people bought when prices were a little bit too high and now they've got to sell to get out of their positions? Those types of moves are often based on emotion and they create exaggerated moves where you can profit pretty quickly. So personally, I mean, I I learned a lot of that through experience, unfortunately, (laughs) trying out a lot of different indicators, reading about um, different types of trading styles and seeing things that worked and didn't work. And a lot of things just did not really work out for me. But um, there's, I mean, there's an infinite number of books or the internet where you can find pretty much everything you want to know about technical analysis. Okay, Greg, same question. I'll actually start with a story, um, and it's how it got me into technical analysis. So my first trading job um, was with a um, commodity trading advisor called Camlin Company in Baltimore. And my boss at the time had worked for a legend, um, Paul Tudor Jones. Uh, And, you know, I was young, I was 21, and I was actually studying for my CFA, which is the quintessential fundamental uh, charter holder um, or uh, membership, whatever you want to call it, certificate. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, isn't this what everybody does? And he said, if you want to understand trading, if you want to understand how to make money, if you want to understand the ins and outs of how markets move, why markets move, he goes, burn that book and learn, understand technical analysis, understand what, why markets do the way, why markets move the way that they do. And so that kind of set me on a whole different path I didn't think was possible. Um, or just I didn't even anticipate. And um, so I went on to get my CMT, which is a Chartered Market Technician's um, certificate. And, you know, that's kind of where my my technical um, career took off. And I think what what a lot of, and you kind of touched on this earlier, Dan, in terms of, you know, the beginner, uh, the Jesus on toast, you know, the, people love to talk about different patterns and stuff like that, head and shoulders, double tops, double bottoms and stuff like that. And it's not that that doesn't matter, but what people need to understand about technical analysis is that there's nothing new under the sun and that what you're, when you're looking at a chart, you're really looking at the collective behavior of all the investors at one time with whatever time period you're looking at. And so human behavior never changes. And if human behavior never changes, then guess what happens with, you know, price behavior that never changes either. Um, it's not to say it's static. My point is, is that it, it, it goes in different cycles. It goes in different trends. It happens over and over and over and over again. And the more you study that, the more you'll understand that, again, you deal in probabilities. But this is why I love technical analysis is because it, it it's not just telling you what's happening, but it also is a risk management tool. So if I understand that a certain pattern, a certain setup, a certain indicator has done this before and it's going to do it again, and then I put that trade on and then that fails, I get out immediately because I know that, you know, it's a failed signal. And sometimes that happens. But when it's a when it's a true signal and you really hit it, you can make a lot of money. So I think there is a misconception about what technical analysis really is. Um, 
and what it means. And, you know, I, I look at a lot of the stuff that, that Drew and Ben talked about. Um, I also look at um, uh, time cycles. I look at GAN analysis. I look at Elliott Wave Theory. So uh, some, you know, a little bit more down the rabbit hole. Um, but I encourage people to, um, to, to, to be more involved with technical analysis. And it's not to say that fundamental analysis doesn't matter either. They both have their place. Um, but just to add to your toolkit, I think technical analysis is a great thing to have. Now, when you say add to your toolkit like that, um, I always wonder about that, Greg, because it's, it's hard to do two things really well in this life. And if I'm a good fundamental bottom-up investor, I, I become skeptical. The, the more I do this, the more I become skeptical that I could sort of add technical analysis um, to my toolkit in that way. So, I mean, does that make sense? No, I, I understand. I, I mean, from I, look, you're a long term fundamental guy. So take the long term technical approach, you know, something like Drew would talk about with a long term moving average. Or, um, you know, you're looking at a 10 year chart and you see that you have this volatility. 2018 was a perfect example. And you see some stocks that are, you know, approaching whatever trend line, whatever moving average, whatever oversold level. And you have a five year horizon. You're like, hey, this thing's on sale. The fundamentals are still in place. And this trend line or support line or moving average is holding. Let's add to our position. So it doesn't mean that you have to be an expert on it, but to recognize the fact that you know there's some type of price behavior occurring around a stock that you like that has the fundamentals that you look for i think that's something that you can add doesn't mean you have to be an expert okay i'm going to start with you ben on this next question um and greg alluded to this question when he talked about you know the price and the market being the sum of what everyone's doing right now i've heard it said that technical analysis is in fact uh, just a way to gauge the psychology of the market. Do you think it's as simple as that? Or or is that just kind of another way of looking at it? How do you feel about that view? I think that's a huge piece of it. Um, yeah, like Greg said, I mean, price action is the result of group behavior. Um, and yeah, I think that's the best way to look at it, really, when you see a huge sell-off based on a headline um, and you can understand that, oh, this is what people are feeling right now and here's what they're doing because of how they're feeling. If you can understand that, then you'll be able to be a little bit more objective and take a position based on your beliefs that don't necessarily... Um, line up with with what the mass psychology is at that moment um especially if it's you know something that you think is temporary okay now uh, drew and greg w would you generally agree with what ben just said yeah i think so i mean it's a it's all you know a piece of the puzzle and it, it helps to to look at it through that lens and then we talked about this today you know when you can get more things to line up so when you get the fundamentals of technicals when you have right sentiment when those things all come together, you know, that's when the picture is really clear and that's when you want to invest. Yeah, I would agree. And I would also add, um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen in my career where something is lining up and it's like, okay, this is a really big setup, but you know, the media is talking about this, uh, this headline is talking about that, you know, it, and then boom, the price action has, it precedes the headline. You see this a lot, uh, you know, President Trump tweets or, you know, China comes out with whatever around the trade or whatever it might be. It's also, it happens a lot around um, economic data, especially payrolls. So, which is this Friday, which I tend to, um, to love to trade because I, I see these setups and I'm like, you know what? I think this is going to be a bad number just based on the price action that I see. And I know that might sound weird, but I promise you, if you study technical analysis enough, you'll begin to see it. It doesn't work every time. Again, you know, we're, we deal in probabilities. We're, we're, uh, we're signal uh, gatherers, not signal hunters. So we deal in the probability of the signals that we see. But I can tell you just from, you know, the 15 years that I've been doing this, that the uh, the price action often leads what the headlines come in, come in with afterwards. Now, that is very, very interesting to me. It's very interesting you said that, Greg, because my next question for all of you would have been this. If 
this really is, if, if this price action that you guys spend your careers looking at every single day um, means, you know, it is essentially a way of gauging the psychology of the market, like before someone buys and sells something, presumably they would have already thought and felt that thing. So I understand that we're going to see the headlines after the price action because that's the way journalism works. But it would seem to me that there's something happening before that price moves. There's some trend at work. And it would be nice, wouldn't it, if there are a way of getting at that before the the price moves. You know? I mean, I mean that's the goal, right? <laughs> Get the newspaper, uh, tomorrow's that's newspaper today. And look, it doesn't, you know, it's not that it's... Uh, people are like, oh, you're a psychic or something. It has nothing to do with that. Again, it's about dealing in the probability. So, um, again, I'll go with the economic data. But, you know, if I see this setup and there's a, uh, again, you deal with the probability, there's an 80% probability, let's say. And I know that if it crosses XYZ level, then I'm wrong. But if I'm right and that setup is big, you know, you can make a lot of money. So that's um, that's where I see it. And it, it just... Again, it happens all the time. I see it all the time, and it just it makes you a believer. Um, and it, it, there's nothing perfect. I mean, the old saying that uh, the stock market um, sole purpose is to embarrass mankind um, has some say there. So you know, it, it, as you said at the beginning, you know, everything it, there's nothing easy in life, and it, and it takes a lot of work. Trust me. But um, you know, it, it, you when you start to see these little intricacies within the market and then around kind of the the media and headlines and and what happens, it, you just begin to to have an appreciation for it. Another thing to add to that is, um, you know, sometimes there are there's price ac- action that just seems out of place uh, given the context of what's happening in the world. Um, for example, I've noticed over the last couple of months, st- steel stocks have been firming up. Um, we recommended a trade on U.S. Steel a while back in Daily Wealth Trader and stopped out of it. But considering the whole um, commentary about slowdown and trade war and all that, you would you would think steel stocks would just be falling apart, and they've held up reasonably well, and they've and they've climbed over the last month or so. Um, and then there was a deal to, um, announced, I think yesterday to buy AK steel stock shot up about 10% or so. And it was already up probably 30% off its lows. You know, why are steel stocks going up in this environment? I don't know, but it caught my eye. And then when AK steel was taken out, you know, I wasn't surprised There's there's something going on there. Um, so I think, I think when you can see these kind of little things in the market that just don't seem to make sense and try and figure out what's going on, sometimes you can't figure out what's going on, but just the price action lets you know that there's something happening there, um, that's worth keeping an eye on. That's interesting to me in a couple of ways. One of them is I, as soon as I hear you say, you know, there's something going on there. My natural inclination is to find out what the heck it is. Like, you know, is there some country that's building bridges or, you know, skyscrapers that I should know about, some some huge country? Um, but I guess the price action is all you need. Is that too simplified, Ben, or is that just about right? Well, it's not all I need. I mean, I'd love to find the fundamental reason for what's going on and, and look for it. I look for the headlines and look for... Um, changes, but a lot of times, like Greg said, the price action precedes the news. So sometimes you see this weird thing that's going on, and then the news comes out later. So the price action is really helpful there. And you've got to you got to remember that the investors that you're trading against are the biggest banks with the smartest people with the most money and the best computers and the most you know developed research teams. They have way more information than we do, and yet they are trading, you know, well ahead of us. So the, they're going to move price action before smaller investors get that information. So the price action is showing you what's likely to happen ahead of time. And I'll even add to that. So 
going back to my days at Campbell, it, I said it was a CTA commodity trading advisor. That is purely a quant fund. It is model driven, meaning we have some unbelievably talented, unbelievably intelligent people in the back. I say in the back, they're in their own offices, but they're researching, researching all the different price action that has happened throughout all of history and putting together math. That has nothing to do with the fundamentals of anything that you're talking about, right? So when people think quant, when people think that, that is technical analysis. They're researching past price behavior to try to profit from future price behavior. Um, so I think that, you know, again, just adds to the uh, the credibility of, of technical analysis and why it should be a part of, of anyone's um, toolkit, even yours, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm not saying you're wrong about that. Um, especially considering what value has done for the last several years. <laughs> I wish I'd had some technical analysis. Uh, so you, you, you bring up an, Drew brought up an interesting point, um, which is that your, your competition has more people and computers and information that, you know, you and I can ever hope to have. Um, that should make what we do harder than what they do, right? Or no? I mean, yeah, I think it does make it more challenging. So you've got to be, you got to mind your risk and you have to, you know, follow some basic, you know, investing rules. You know, you want to control your downside and unlimit your upside, right? So you want to hold on to winners and you want to make sure you don't lose too much when you're wrong. Uh, but you also want to make sure you cut those trades quickly when you're not right because, you know, an outcome in the market is not certain. So, you know, these guys have been talking about risk management at length and it's critical to your success. And I'll also say something around that in terms of, you know, there's there's a misnomer and a general misunderstanding about what professional trading actually is. And you talk about big gains and you see these hedge fund guys and stuff like that, you know, in a professional environment. And I'll just give you a, a really small example. Um, you know, there was a fund that I was looking at and this is how professional trading works. They'll give you $10 million and you keep 50% of everything that you make. Sounds pretty good, right? But the moment you go below zero, they start cutting your book. So if you're down 2%, 3%, they're cutting your book one, two, three, four million dollars. Why do they do that? They want to do that because they don't want you taking on tremendous amounts of risk. I talked about how trading is just simply short-term investing. And what they want to see is, you know, a thousand dollars here, five thousand dollars there. You know, when you have a loss, it's five hundred dollars to a thousand. When you have a gain, it's five thousand to seven thousand. And at the end of the year, you make five to seven percent. Let's say you make seven percent. You keep, you can do the math. That's pretty. That's pretty damn good living, right? And you keep doing that year after year after year. Yes. Let's say every three years, you know, you're up seven or eight percent. Maybe you're up eleven. You go for that twenty percent year. Um, you know, if it's September, October, and you go for that. So I think there's a, a, a misconception about what trading is. Uh, you know, they, oh, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. It's really about just that short-term investing and creating alpha, but it's absolute return. You're not worried about a benchmark. You're not worried about anything else other than extracting short-term gains out of the market. And technical analysis is definitely a way to do that. Extracting short-term gains from the market just sounds so insanely difficult to a guy like me. It's, I mean, it's not easy, but it, it's, it can be done. <laughs> it's not easy. But like you said, yeah. what is? Right, what is? What is, in, what is easy in life that's worth doing? All right, so I wonder if we could talk right now about any specific, like we've made your views on where stocks are probably going in the short term and then maybe over the next year. Your bearish short term bullish longer term next year or so. Are there any specific pockets of opportunity? And we'll start with you, Ben, um, that you guys are looking at right now. You don't have to give away your trade advice that you sell to people in the Daily Wealth Trader, but maybe you can just generally tell us about pockets of opportunity that you've seen you know, recently. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll mention um, one that's caught my eye just... Um, Every every month at the start of the month in Daily Wealth Trader, we do a sector update. Uh, we look at the 11 major sectors of the S&P 500, and we look at their performance over the past month and past six months. Um, and, you know, a lot of people just look at what are the major indexes doing, but they don't look down at the sector level. 
And when you break it down to the sector level, you start to see which sectors are leading the market, which sectors are lagging, um, and the story is a lot more complete. So for a long time, healthcare had been lagging the market, and probably for the last, at least the last year, um, going back, I mean, a few months back, a year prior to that, healthcare had really been doing poorly. Over the last few months, it started to do really well. And actually, I think last, our latest sector update, um, looking back at November, healthcare was the best or second best over both time frames. And to me, that that says there's something changing here. And I'm really interested in healthcare stocks. They've been really strong lately. Uh, I'd like to see a pullback. And if we get a pullback, we're definitely looking to buy healthcare names. So, um, yeah, they've been lagging. Now they're leading. That's a bullish sign. Sounds good. Drew, do you have a different one than that? Uh, I would agree with everything Ben just said. Yeah, there's in the last you know couple of weeks, we've seen a ton of deals come through in biotech. Um, so that kind of matches up with this uh, with that big theme. And then there's one other sector I've been keeping an eye on. That's the home builders. Um, they've been up about, or they are up about 50% this year. Uh, and they've just been incredibly strong. We've traded, uh, Toll Brothers a few times, which is a luxury home builder. And that's one that we, uh, we don't have a position on, but we'll probably be looking at again here in the future. And, uh, yeah, so that's a sector that we like a lot. Okay. Sounds good. Greg, how about you? Any, any specific pockets of opportunity you're finding lately? Give me some volatility, Dan. That's what I need. I need some volatility. Um, no, it's, uh, you know, pockets, you know, I, I, I actually, I do like healthcare. You know, I put out a piece a couple of weeks ago. Um, it hasn't been keeping up with the overall market. Um, but there, over the, over the last week or two, there has been incredible strength. Um, so I agree with Ben and Drew on, on a pullback. That's probably a long-term buy. Um, I'm also looking at retail. Um, and, and, and in the short term, I'm a little concerned about it. Uh, if you look at, and I'm going to actually talk about this next week a lot, but if you look at what is the XRT, which is the retail ETF, um, it, it's really just been a, a kind of a choppy consolidated mess for the last call it 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, and that speaks to the consumer. I mean, you look, I mean, this is holiday season. You look at black Friday, apparently there was just hardly anybody <laughs> in the, the brick and mortar stores, um, relative to past years. Um, and you know, Oh, well, everything is online. Well, then you look at Amazon and that topped out in 2018 and, um, and hasn't been, you know, as strong as you would have think now that, you know, some of that has to do with cloud business and other things, but you know, the retail side, um, is something that I'm going to keep an eye on because, going out long term in terms of uh, looking where pockets of opportunity are for long term investments you know i think that uh as interest rates continue to go lower and if the fed keeps cutting which i think they will um you know that is just going to spur um uh lower interest rates uh more credit available and that is the Fed's goal is to get people to spend money. So if that's the case, that's the long term fundamental case. But, you know, in the in the short term, the technical picture, you know, it's just kind of saying, you know, there's not much here. Interesting. OK. Um, you know, that's just about all the time we have. But I do want to go to each one of you. I, this is like the standard way that I end all my interviews, because I think it really helps the listener a lot. So I, I'd be really be grateful if you guys could do that each um, ben, if we could start with you, if I could ask you just to leave our listener with one thought, what might that be? Um, I'd say that even if you're skeptical that stocks are going higher, um, hold some stocks and kind of build your positions over time. I think that the I think that interest rates could will likely stay lower for longer than people expect. I think stocks could rise for longer than people expect. And you don't want to be out of the stock market here. So start small if you're skeptical. Um, cut your risk whenever you can, but definitely hold stocks. Okay, Drew, how about you? One thought to leave the listener with? Yeah, I would say, uh, I would echo Ben's thoughts and say that, you know, the market is in an uptrend. We're trading, you know, right near all-time highs. Uh, so you, you want to stay 
with stocks. You know, crashes are not that common, and everybody seems to want to predict one every other day. It's just better to mind the trend and continue riding the stocks higher. And you, Greg, one thought for our listener. One thought is control your risk. When it comes to trading, when it comes to investing, no matter what, control your risk. That means position sizing, get out when you're wrong, control your risk. I cannot think of a better place to leave us. Thank you for that. Um, listen, thank you guys for doing this. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I, I, maybe we can, you know, get back together in six months and uh, and and do it again sometime. That'd be nice. That would be nice. Yep. Sounds good, Dan. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you in six months. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Hey, guys, real quick, I just want to tell you something. As host of the Stansberry Investor Hour podcast, I also enjoy listening to other podcasts. It helps me figure out ways to make the Stansberry Investor Hour a better experience for you. One podcast I really like is called We Study Billionaires, hosted by Preston Pish and Stig Broderson of the InvestorsPodcast.com. It's the biggest investor podcast on the planet, enjoyed by thousands of listeners every week. Preston and Stig interview legendary billionaires like Jack Dorsey, founder and CEO of Twitter and payments company Square, and billionaire investor Howard Marks, whose book The Most Important Thing I've recommended dozens of times. Sometimes Preston and Stig spend a whole episode reviewing lessons learned from billionaires they've studied like Dell computer founder Michael Dell, tech industry maverick Peter Thiel, and macro trader Stanley Druckenmiller. Before starting the We Study Billionaires podcast, Preston went to West Point and Johns Hopkins, founded an investment company, and his finance videos have been viewed by millions. Stig went to Harvard and worked for a leading European energy trading firm. They're smart, experienced investors who know the wealth-building secrets of billionaires better than anyone, and their listeners love it, and I'm one of those listeners. Head over to theinvestorspodcast.com and check out We Study Billionaires with Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Theinvestorspodcast.com. Check it out. All right, folks, it's time for the mailbag. This is where you and I get to have a conversation about investing. I read all of your emails every week, so please keep sending them. You can write into feedback at investorhour.com with all of your comments, questions, and politely worded criticisms, and I will read every single one of them. No longer reading the Russian spam, but I'm reading everything you send me. And... I have a couple this week. It was kind of light, you know, around the holidays, kind of expect that. But the first one is, brings up an interesting topic. It's from Brendan K. And he says, hi, Mr. Ferris, I wanted to get your opinion on tax loss harvesting, given we are at the end of the year. I have a couple of securities in my portfolio that I don't want to sell, but I'm interested in applying this method to save money on taxes. And for example, he says, take, for example, Altius Minerals, with which I have an unrealized loss of about 10 to 15 percent. Is this a good stock to sell and buy again in the new year or only buy more since the price yields a better value and could double overnight? Which characteristics or underlying qualities of a stock would make you consider applying tax loss harvesting to a given security? Any advice or simply your opinion would be much appreciated. As always, thank you for all the value you provide us each and every week. I'm coming around. Oh, he says, I'm coming around to the new podcast format. <laughs> Best regards, Brendan K. Well, thank you, Brendan. This is an interesting topic. I cannot comment specifically on Altius because I've recommended it in my newsletter. So that might this might be misconstrued as giving individual advice. But I can tell you generally how I feel about this. It is mostly applicable to highly speculative things. In my opinion, this is the way I see it. I see it as being mostly applicable to more speculative names like, you know, biotech and the really small cap 
mining stocks with like no revenue and some of them even have no assets to speak of but you know the the real flyers right if you intend if if i intend on holding something for a long time to me it's not a candidate for tax loss harvesting because i don't like the idea of buying something and then you know selling something for tax loss and then buying it back also depending on you you should ask your accountant how much how much you can really um, expect to save on taxes. Because overall, I found that it ain't much. And for me, at this point in my life, it's not even worth thinking much about this. So, you know, there's that. I don't know what your situation is, but you, you should ask your accountant about it. And, uh, and overall, too, I think, I think it's a mistake in general to prioritize tax considerations. You should prioritize, in my opinion, whether or not you really like the business and want to keep holding it, whether or not they're making lots of money, doing what you expect them to do, rather than trying to save a few bucks on taxes one year by thinking that you're clever and you know selling and buying back. So I, I, that's about all I can say, and, and I, hope, I hope it's helpful, but what you should really do is check with a tax professional to find out what you should do. But those are my thoughts on how I think about what I do, okay? And I just have one more of these this week. This is from Paul E. And I think Paul E., I just have a a portion of his. His was a longer one. But he says, you are a gentleman and a scholar. I think most listeners would love to spend time with you. Keep just being you and you will continue to be great at this. I do have one question for you. On a few of your podcasts, you have mentioned that the road ahead looks tough for bonds. I believe you were implying treasury bonds. I own corporate bonds via Stansbury credit opportunities. When you say bonds, are you typically talking about treasuries or do you bucket both treasuries and corporate bonds together? Paul E. So, Paul, there's there's a difference. It's not whether it's treasuries or corporates for me, although in general, you know, the treasuries, they're... They're good, you know. The interest is going to be paid, and the principal is going to be paid back. They they can print the money to do it. So I, I think you're you're pretty safe there, and you know a lot of corporate bonds are pretty safe too. But to figure out whether they're safe, it's it's a it's a bottom up exercise. That's what they do in Stansbury Credit Opportunities. They they do the same thing with bonds that we do in stocks in Extreme Value. They take them one at a time from the bottom up. So. Whether or not a particular bond is a good idea is different than noticing that the bond market globally is valued more highly than it's ever been in history. It's hard to believe, right? It's hard to believe that, you know, even if you buy, say you buy some sovereign yielding bond, I'm sorry, a sovereign bond that's yielding like, you know, just say 1% you know, from some country like Japan. Now, I think a lot of those things are yielding negative. So this 1% bond is a fantasy right now. But let's just say it's a, you know, let's just say it's a five or 10 year bond that yields 1%. I think you're going to get your 1%. You're going to get your principal back. What I have noticed that I think is crazy is that all the negative yielding debt in developed sovereign countries, and Japan's the biggest one, that's why the example makes it a fantasy. <laughs> so Japan's the biggest one, and, and Europe, most of the rest of them are in Europe that are negative yielding. So to me, that's crazy. And you're guaranteed to get less out of it. You're guaranteed to lose money. You're guaranteed to get less back than you put in. But people buy them because they're just so scared. And, you know, we had Mark Dow on the program several episodes ago, and he told us some reasons why people buy them. You know, they're currency hedges and, and you know, there's a fear trade too. So I don't know. I, I don't know if that makes it clear. It, it, to me, the bottom line is, the, the part that I hope is clear is that saying the overall bond market is expensive is very different than assessing individual bonds one at a time. That's that's what I have to say about that. It's a very good question, though, Paul. You know, when I, when I say stocks are are more expensive than ever in history, people write and say, and you still recommend stocks, right? And okay, that's a valid question, but they're two kind of totally different things. 
And we recognize, too, part of this is that we recognize that, I hate to, I hate to refer to it as this, but calling the top or, you know, it, it amounts to calling the top, which is something I don't want to have to admit to doing because I think it's a fool's errand. But, but when you get cautious because you think things are too high, it's sort of like calling a top, I have to admit. And that's rare. You probably won't do it. You may get within the neighborhood of it. And like I said earlier in the program, you know, if you even come close to it, if you even come close to recognizing that stocks are way, way overvalued, if you're within two years of it or three years, in, two, in the year 2000, when that bear market finally hit, it took stocks back to like 1996 levels. So you can be within a few years and still be right, even though it looks like you're wrong for a few years. You get what I'm saying there? So, so noticing these things, it's, it's valuable, but it's really difficult. I think it's easier to find a great business and buy their stock or find a great business and buy their bond, actually. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It's a very good question. Uh, I feel like I could do half the program on that sometimes. It's very good. Okay, folks, that's it for another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I love being here. It's a privilege to come to you this week and every week. Please go to our website, www.investorhour.com, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, and you can see a transcript of every episode we've ever done. You can also enter your email for alerts about upcoming episodes. That's www.investorhour.com. Also, Go to the iTunes store and subscribe to the podcast and give us a like while you're there. That'll help push us up in the rankings. We'll get more listeners. It'll improve the quality of the show and improve the quality of this conversation that we get to have every week. Okay, it'll be good for you, good for me, good for everybody. That's Stansberry Investor Hour at iTunes. Subscribe and like. Thanks so much for being here with me once again. Can't wait to talk to you next time. Bye-bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansbury Investor Hour is produced by Stansbury Research and is copyrighted by the Stansbury Radio Network.